All right. Ding. Oh. What's that song that always starts the movies where it's like the, the colors pan across? It's like... Welcome to Spoiler Talk, where we talk spoilers. I am your host, Kieran, and with me, well, is Jax. Hey, hey, another lockdown episode. A show born in lockdown, and we're still in lockdown. Lockdown 6, and I'm so keen to talk. What are we talking today, Kieran? We're talking Quentin Tarantino's fifth film, Death Proof. <laughs> oh, yeah. One in the two-part Grindhouse Trilogy. And Kieran, before we get deep into this stuff, I'm going to show a little DVD that can't fit in my fucking DVD case because it's it's so big, it's so bulky, it's insane. Death Proof and Planet Terror, two films that came out together, but we're only talking Death Proof today. The Tarantino film. But the thing about it, though, is to me, it's all about my filmography. And I actually, I want to go out with a terrific film. Death Proof has got to be the worst movie I ever make. And that's not a, and for a left-handed movie, that wasn't so bad. All right, you know, so if that's the worst I ever get, I'm, I'm good. But I do think one of those one out of touch old limp flaccid dick movies cost you three good movies as far as your, your, your uh, uh, rating is concerned. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been revisiting lots of Tarantino and I thought we should talk about this one specifically because I wanted to have a conversation that I didn't think was being had about this film because it's really Death Proof has kind of in the public consciousness, it's almost devolved into, oh, it's just Tarantino's worst film. And while I would agree with that sentiment, I still think it's a fantastic movie I really, really like it. I've rewatched it twice in the last week. I only saw it once back in 2007 or eight when it came out and uh, I didn't love it. But since revisiting it, I've really, really changed my opinion. I've been listening to lots of Tarantino podcasts. He's been going on lots of different podcasts and talking to lots of different people, promoting his uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood book. Ah, yes, yes. But Jax, uh, let's start with you. I want to know, now that you've revisited Death Proof, what do you think of the film? So Death Proof for me is, and as you said, a lot of people do say this is his worst film. And I would say that this film and Jackie Brown both fall into the category of, not necessarily for me, worst film. I think Tarantino is... Not even arguably. He's just almost factually set. But everything is up to everyone's own personal opinion. But Tarantino is kind of, at least for me, like undoubtedly one of the most interesting, innovative, insane directors. Like one of the most talked about, and especially for people our age, you go to film school and people are like, what's your favorite film, buddy? Fight Clubs and Pulp Fictions and Reservoir Dogs are out the wazoo. You know what I mean? Like, people bloody love that shit. I think that he is an exceptional filmmaker. He's a master of what he does. But Death Proof and Jackie Brown, for me, have always been the two that have fallen way down the rung. Like, you've got them somewhere at the bottom, and then, like, 40 steps up, you've got... Pulp Fictions, Reservoir Dogs and stuff. And then right at the top for me is Inglorious Bastards and uh, 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 Django Unchained, which I really, oh. really love. I love those two movies. I think they're easily my favorite two of his. Right. We'll get into those another time, yeah. but I love Django Unchained. God damn, I think it's a masterpiece. But Death Proof for me was always the film where I was like, I actually, re-watching it, was like, I don't think I've seen this film since I saw it in the cinema at the Astor Theatre in Melbourne here in Australia. It's kind of like the go-to theatre when you get to go see, like, a uh, this kind of film where it's like, it's not your... Like, during the time I saw this film, like, Tropic Thunder was coming out and shit like that. And, like, I don't know. It was like, we're going to do a double feature with this and Planet Terror. Planet Terror being Rodriguez's other grindhouse film. And I remember leaving the cinema and the two mates I went to see it with were like, Death Proof's amazing. Planet Terror's a piece of shit. I'm like, you're both fucking piece of shit idiots. Death Proof was fucking garbage. And not garbage, but I was like, no, no, I thought uh, Planet Terror was way better. A lot more fun, zombies, gore, 
just, you know, it just kind of had more that I was like looking for at that time, I suppose. Very young. I was in year seven or eight, like very young, like 13, 14. Um, and I hadn't thought that I'd rewatch this film, but there's a moment where it's like real missing. And I'm like, I've seen that scene. I, I, I must have seen this film since I got it, since I watched it on my DVD, Blu-ray thingy. Not Blu-ray, just on my DVD thingy. But what do I think of this film now in 2021, re-watching it? It's a grubby, dirty film. A lot of this film made me feel really gross and disgusting. There's essentially, I don't know, there's this really bizarre line of like, we're watching essentially two arcs and two separate, completely un like related arcs, except that Kurt Russell is stalking these women. And he's barely the main character in any way, except that he's kind of involved in both sequences. And we spent a long, long time having just a bunch of women sitting at bars, singing in cars, just shit talking about boys and dicks and just stuff where I'm like, Tarantino is a master of filmmaking, a master of the cinematography in this film is great. The way the camera moves, the way the dialogue flows and the chemistry between the characters, the acting and all the actors is exceptional. It's all flowing. There's a snappy kind of brilliant feel of like the bar scenes feel like real bar scenes where people are just having a drink and it's and there's this feeling where I'm like it's almost teetering on the brink of meandering it's so close to meandering beyond nothingness until Kurt Russell decides to fucking spoilers fucking try and murder them all horrifically with his murder death proof car but I'm not bored but I am very frustrated with the characters we're following. I find a lot of them really annoying to follow. And a lot of the time by the end, I'm just like, fucking Jungle Julia. Do I give a fuck if she's fucking killed in a car accident? Maybe not. And I, I maybe that kind of annoys me. But also the car chases and sequences and violence and gore in this is spectacularly filmed. It's absolutely disgusting, horrifying when it's meant to be. It's exhilarating when it's meant to be. It's tense and thrilling when it's meant to be and it's very on you the edge of your seat when it's meant to be but when i came away from it i felt just like the same i did when i watched it in the cinema where i'm like this is so so much dialogue that just made me kind of angry and annoyed and just fuck all these chicks just chatting and it just felt like so much time was wasted and I don't know, just so grubby and dirty and disgusting. You've got Eli Roth being like, let's get these chicks drunk and fuck them. And both sequences with two different sets of women throw one of their female friends under the bus where they're like, let's leave him with this fucking creep who's obviously a creep and imply that she's going to be fucking horribly raped or she's going to... And then one of them's like, I have did a thing on the radio and you got to do a lap dance now if some creep comes up and says some lines. And it just... There's just a weird grossness of the film that I couldn't escape. But at the end of the film, I was kind of impressed by a lot of it, but also kind of disgusted by some of it in a weird way. And it, I, I really don't even know how I feel about it. Kieran, what do you think about this film? I know you love it. T- convince me why it's better than it is worse. Convince well, I'll, me. I'll, I'll start with the, with, the, with the main criticism people have of the film, and that is that yes. the, the, the dialogue is meandering. I could yep. not yep. disagree more. I think the dialogue yep. in both sequences, the, the first sequence is shorter than the second sequence. Both, yep. uh, both sets of girls in these two separate environments, I think perfectly set up and establish who these people are, where they are in proximity to each other, their ethics, their morals, their outlook on the world. And more importantly, in the second set, the dialogue that we get in the diner sequence when they're all together in a single one shot actually sets up everything you need for that final set piece. We get the information that two of the girls are actors, two of them are stunt women, um, there's a wonderful line uh, that you don't even know is set up for something. Someone says, well, well, you know, I've, I've got a knife. And the other girl says, do you know what happens to people who have knives? They get shot. That girl <laughs> later in the film pulls a gun out and shoots Kurt Russell in the arm. What a perfect little setup payoff. Um, also, the fact that Zoe Bell is just 
it, it can just survive anything because she's the most incredible stunt woman on planet Earth. Uh, I mentioned this in another podcast we did for The Suicide Squad that Quentin Tarantino worked with Uma Thurman on Pulp Fiction and they began an incredibly productive creative relationship that blossomed into the idea for Kill Bill. He would then come back and revisit and then make Kill Bill with Uma Thurman despite the fact that she got pregnant. He just weaved it into the plot and he made... Potentially, you know, the greatest action film of all time. Um, at, at least one of. It's one of the most yeah. influential films I've ever seen. It's it got some of the most iconic cinema moments that I can think of. And I would say that Death Proof's biggest flaw is that it's not iconic. And everything okay. else that Quentin Tarantino has made is iconic. So when you're comparing the iconic scenes in Pulp Fiction, in Inglorious Bastards, in Django Unchained, I even think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood in, a, in another decade or so will, will, will be in that list of top tier. Mm -hmm. um, Death, Proof, Death Proof, like Jackie Brown, is doing something very different. He's giving you a film where if you want to go and spend time with these characters, that you can sink into it, live in this world for a while, and go back to what you were doing, yet think about the extended sequences of dialogue and conversation and the thrill ride, essentially, that these, that these films go on. Jackie Brown, I've revisited as well, and I would love to talk about that one day, because I think that's a movie that gets better every time you rewatch it. Okay, yeah. Death Proof, I think it's just, and I said this with Suicide Squad, so for fear of repeating myself, I, th I think it's a great one-two punch of a film. I think, that, I think that the perfect setup for the film is the subversion of the fact that we get introduced to all of these women, that we get these extended sequences of dialogue, that we find out who all of these people are so intimately and deeply, only for it all to be ripped away from us, which feeds all of the tension going into the second half of the film. So now when we have to start from scratch again and we're relearning about these characters, there's an intentional sense that we just did this. We just did yeah. this and you're doing it again. So now I know where the film's going. I know what's going to happen. What you don't know is that we're setting up the most badass chicks that are going to take <laughs> this motherfucker down. Yeah. And they do it. So it's a, it's a car exploitation meets a slasher film that turns into a revenge flick. And I think when you take into account the films that he's paying homage to, and, and, and obviously it's the grindhouse exploitation film, films of the 70s and 80s, that, that this really stands, I think, above... Uh, Planet Terror, because it's it's subverting those expectations. It's using what you know about those exploitation films of the past, and it's using them to flip it on its head, but also do it. It gives you both. It gives you two films. It gives you both the crackled, degraded film, 70s, this film's been played a million times look, and then when we jump to the second half, that aesthetic kind of gets washed away. The film's cleaner, crisper, yeah, more colourful, more vibrant. Everything pops. And I, I, I have to say, I think Zoe Bell makes this film, even though she's only in half of it. I think the stunt sequences on the car are incredible. Absolutely incredible. A woman holding two belts on the hood of a car with no ropes, no wires, no CGI, no bullshit. There's, the, the car chase hasn't been chopped up into a million pieces. Look, I love the Winter Soldier, but the Winter Soldier doesn't have a car chase that comes close to death proof. Yet the Winter Soldier is heralded as this incredible action spectacle amazing thing and I think it's only that in the context of where the Marvel movies are at that point and where they've gone since just mm. go and take any car chase out of the Winter Soldier and look at how chopped up it is look at how much coverage there is look at how 
little thought has been put into so many of the sequences and you begin to realize like just the mastery that's been put on display here and the fact that it's real it it just it just adds such an incredible amount of weight i don't think the dialogue's meandering because it's informing everything that's coming after it's setting up our actresses it's setting up our stunt women it's setting up all the details that are feeding on into the final part of the film but i will say that i think there's two cuts of this film and the shorter tighter cut is the superior cut oh you think i think so yeah, yeah. Without the real missing, so you don't think we need that lap dance. That no, right? and I think the film's better without it because that sense yeah, yeah. of mystery, yeah. the sense of mystery you get when he spends all that time convincing them and then smash cut and they're walking out into the parking lot, it's almost like a slap in the face that wakes you back up. It, 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 it makes you go, what the fuck? And you're almost... Oh, you're off kilter. You're, 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 you're turned away from it. All of these emotions that people use to criticize the film, this time watching it, I saw them as integral uh, pieces of the puzzle that added up to the third act being one of the most enjoyable thrill rides that, that I've experienced in some time. Car chase, action sequence, however you want to define it. Define it. It's incredible and it's all because of the setup in the first part the things we get the things we don't get the things we think are important about a tarantino film the things that you think you know about him because you've seen pulp fiction and reservoir dogs you think you know everything's going to narratively tie up the way you perfectly expect it to he's subverting every part he's subverting his own films he's subverting what you think you know about him and i think maybe I mean, it rubbed me the wrong way when I first saw it. I just think that maybe he just subverted a bit too much. It was subversion maybe for subversion's sake to the point that he turned so many people off that it didn't matter how good the end was. It didn't matter that, the, that he actually delivered the promise, that he actually he delivered that, that promise in the middle. He gives you just a taste of what this guy's capable of. He replays the car sequence slamming in at 100 kilometers an hour to to these characters one of which i think we've grown to really like and connect with and some other ones that are peripheral and jungle julia who's pretty unlikable i think but she is unlikable in the film because she did something pretty unlikable to her friend some people are unlikable sometimes and the mix of characters in that car i mean watching her leg get ripped off if you hate her, it's a little more enjoyable. And when you see the wheel hit the girl's face who you like, oh, it's kind of, ah, oh, fuck, we saw that one last. There was a part of me that thought, oh, she was going to survive. No, nope. she gets the worst of it, almost. Um, it, it feels kind of redundant to say this, but I think the soundtrack is absolutely killer. I, I, I think that would be the one thing that I, I think, not having the lap dance scene, I think that's my favorite song, that... Honky tonk down in Mexico. You know, <laughs> yeah. I love that song yeah. so much. So I, I do, even though I think the shorter, tighter version is better, um, just because it delivers the package and it gives you everything the longer version does. But the longer version is the version I think that you watch after you've seen the movie. And if you want to revisit and spend a little more time, you want to get a little bit more fleshed out with the characters. There's a little bit more introduction for the second group of girls. Um, there's some extended dialogue here and there, but they're both very much the same. There's not a huge amount of difference. I just think that... It, it, I mean, I can't remember a time I've been more excited that when the, the, than when Kurt Russell convinces Rose McGowan to get in his death-proof car, watches the ladies pull out of the parking lot, and then turns and looks at the camera dead on oh there's a smile it's so good it's so yeah. amazing it's just fantastic the fact that it's kurt russell too makes it even better um the, a guy who whose career was was kind of down in the dirt at this point in time he was not the star that he once was but the fact that he had that star bona fide quality about him adds a lot to that moment in time I think, 2007 when it came out. It was interesting to hear that his first choice was Mickey Rock 
uh, which would have been. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Different film. Kurt yeah, Russell's very. Uh, charisma, for me, kind of saves this movie from falling into kind of the gutters of despair and grubbiness that I kind of feel like I was kind of. You saying all this stuff is really interesting though, because I think that you're kind of turning me more onto the. Because I'm almost fifty fifty. But I was keen to hear kind of your positive aspects of this film because I, I did think there's a lot going for this film that's great. But to me, there are moments that just kind of really like, I don't know, just like obviously you watch a film, not if a character's meant to be likable. But I just found it kind of like there's only little aspects of the characters before in that first act that made me go enough to care like there's a, like a tiny bit with jungle julia where she's on her phone and the music kind of changes and the feeling changes and you get this kind of like intimate feeling into her as she's texting this guy and yeah. then she doesn't, he doesn't respond and i'm like oh i'm really liking this but then she gets such glee out of being like we're in a grubby dirty bar and with gross disgusting men and a bunch of them are gonna come up and fucking give you a lap dance because i said they could and i'm just like I don't know, I was just like, what the fuck, bitch? Like, no, like, I'm just, you're an awful friend and I don't fucking like you and I don't want to keep following you and I don't care if you score any pot. But she gives, you're so arrogant about trying to score pot and I just... She I just gives was her like, an out. She says, look, if you don't want to do it, just sure, say that sure. some other motherfucker came up to you and that you already but, did it. And, but and, that's, that, that and feels... And it's perfectly handled... By Kurt Russell, who has been following them around, because you know yeah. he listened to that radio show. <laughs> you know he heard it. And there's a weird sexual energy to his murder with the car. There's like a power dynamic that he's like really attached to. And it's and it's also so let me touch on the Eli Roth character because <laughs> The very, very small part he has in the film serves a very important purpose. And that okay. purpose is to to uh, show the audience that Kurt Russell, this stuntman from a bygone era, this out of touch, you know, this guy who can't even get work in Hollywood anymore because they don't do real car chases. They don't do, it's all CGI now. <laughs> Girls in the As uh, the charm chick says, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is really fundamentally, I think Quentin Tarantino grappling with the idea of what film is of what exploitation cinema is, of how it, how action sequences, how car chases, how all of these things have been degraded by culture. And in the public consciousness of young people, it's a joke. It's a joke like Kurt Russell is. And Kurt Russell has been just mistreated and thrown aside by society. And he's come out the other end a psychopath. He's also a complete coward, we find out at the end of the film, which I yeah. love because people who have power, oftentimes, and they become twisted by it, as soon as you strip it away, they're just a scrambling mess of a person. As soon as he yeah. gets shot and the tables get turned and Zoe Bell grabs that pole, jumps oh, onto the side, on the side of the vehicle, of the car, and yeah. they do a burnout, <laughs> I mean... Oh my god, it's so good. It's so yeah. exceptional. It's so fantastic. I love it so much. It just it just exudes everything I want out of a car chase and action sequence. I want it I, I almost think that like the, the the characters in the first part, like there's a very very like they're very clearly trying to steer you towards like liking one and 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 being indifferent to others and giving you that sense of I mean, she's just a girl on a night out. And I think Kurt Russell even says to her at one point, you know, I can see that you're like broken by the fact that no one's asked you. I, I did really like, you know, you know what? Did, sorry, I don't want to yeah, cut off because you're doing the great bit, but I have been super negative, but it's, it's little tiny moments of incredible dialogue and incredible kind of character work that I really did find really got. I, I watched this movie just one sitting, boom. And I was just like, oh shit, it's it's over. Like that, you know, it it didn't drag for me. It wasn't meandering. I just think that like part of me just feels like I'm like, fuck, it just like this film almost, almost feels like it's like 90, 40, no, sorry, 49% feels like to me, 
at times like it's not doing anything. And then you realize that all these moments are just being very human and they're just at a bar. So you've got to have them just being at the bar to set up that they are just going drinking at a bar. And then you get these human as fuck great character moments where he comes up and he's like, yo, you don't want to give me that lap dance because I'm a scar and a... I'm clearly a psychopathic murderer with my psychopathic car that you've seen. You, you know I'm stalking you. I can say that I've just been in town, but Austin isn't that small, Kurt Russell. <laughs> I haven't been there, but it's not that small. I just know. I don't know. Nowhere's that small. But he convinces her because he breaks into her psyche. As you said, with like, no one's come up to you yet. Yeah. No one has said you, you, you heard this thing and you went, oh, fuck my friend, that fucking bitch. But then you also kind of went, well, I'm going to get you a bunch of guys coming up asking for lap dancers. And, and then that, that, that intense, yeah, I don't know, it, it, it plays with a lot of different emotions. And then he has this disgusting line where he's like, there's nothing sexier than a bruised ego and a sexy dame or whatever <laughs> he says. And I'm just like, wah, wah, oh, I don't know, I just... I've seen this movie before, so I knew he was going to fucking murder them. So it just freaked me out. It just There's just this dirtiness to it, which I think is a credit to his filmmaking. Honestly, it's like he don't, he's doing so much, honestly, with like literally the like three lines of three lines of dialogue could get you through this whole film. They have a drink. He kills them. They, they, they buy a car. He tries to kill them. They kill him. You know, it's like it's so bare bones. But yeah, those those character moments and those like those as the critics would deem it meandering nothing scenes and even i've just said it then but it's they are steeped in a lot of character and a lot of uh a lot really... of groundwork for that's being done yes, in, in in service of the film in service of the action in service yep. of the characters yep. in service of like paying off all of these elements i think i just i think it's it, it's kind of like what ryan Jones. Uh, sorry it's kind of like what Ryan Johnson does and, and what I think a lot of people got turned off by his style, especially with The Last Jedi, because it was a, you know, such a big, well-known property. And this idea of constantly subverting what, what people either wanted or thought they wanted uh, really like turned people off because Star Wars is very archetypal and it's very... It's larger than life in a way that you almost don't want deconstructed because the archetype itself is a deconstruction of the hero myth of, you know, not a deconstruction. It is that in its most pristine form to a fault, but yeah. it's delivered in an aesthetic that you don't recognize and in a, in a, in a manner that is a little bit elusive and, and goes in directions you don't quite expect. But it's not until you finish Return of the Jedi that you realize, oh, he just had the hero's journey. It was just split up and pulled apart and, and over the course of several films. Yeah. Um, it, you know, like people always complain no, about the original sure. Star Wars and how they hate Luke Skywalker because he's an annoying, whiny kid. And I say, you don't get it. Because if you're <laughs> not in for that annoying, whiny kid, you need you need that annoying whiny kid because it, there's there's no there's no sense of full circle completion of growth of anything if he's just a perfect Jedi in a New Hope and a perfect Jedi and you know this sure, may be sure. one of the yeah. reasons yeah. that people didn't like the sequel trilogy because many people felt that Rey was that that she won her battles yeah. a little too easily that she that she was able to do things a, a, a little you know, a little too conveniently at times. And um, what we really want is to watch these characters struggle for two films and then win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, fall down that ditch, then crawl out of it. And, yeah, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, there's never a point where you feel like Ray is wrong or making a bad decision, really. Or, you know, even when she leaves Luke Skywalker, you're like on her side. When Luke leaves Yoda, yeah, yeah, you're like, no, guy. stay. <laughs> what are you doing? This is obviously a, a trap. Um, but, but look, I, I just think this movie is brisk. It's cool. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's an homage to a bygone era. It's a love letter to the best parts of, uh, of, of, it's, it's an homage to the best parts of the worst parts of cinema, <laughs> which, are, which are these like grungy exploitation films. And it's someone who loves 
this stuff that this slimy, dirty, underbelly growth and these almost having like Zoe Bell, someone who's not acted before and is, is, is surrounded by magnificent actresses, you know, up against Rosario Dawson and Mary Elizabeth mm. Winstead. She should not yeah, hold her Jesus, own, yeah. but she does like, Oh, hundred percent. She's a stand. So is the, are you saying that this is her first film role then her, because of actor, her first role, her first speaking role. She didn't even, <sighs> she didn't know until I believe, I, I remember reading something recently that she didn't even know the significance of her role in the film until she saw her name on the poster. So it's, it's, it's you know, she, she obviously knew she was what? a large what? part of the film, but I don't think she realized she was going to get main star billing, that she was going to be, it would be Kurt Russell, Zoe Bell and Rosario Dawson, you know? Oh, wow, right. Because, yeah, because you saying that, I think even in the scenes where they're just having, like there's that one shot where they're having drinks and they're all shit talking. Because my, my favorite scene outside of the car chase at the end is when the friends all razz uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead into thinking that calling her Australian, not New Zealand, <laughs> uh, offends her. That's and she amazing. gets really offended for a second. And I mean, obviously, you know, we're Australian, so there's a bit of like yeah. local kind of thing. But just because when she speaks, I'm like, I remember watching the film and I'm like, geez, she's like, super new zealandy like yeah that's yeah. awesome like I, it just stood out to me because it's an accent uh one of my best friends in uh high school like his he was but he didn't really have an accent but his sister had a really strong accent so it's always stood out to me as like a you know very specific accent that i'm very aware of and obviously when you're not aware of accents or you are it just stands out to you but that to me was just very funny because obviously who gives a fuck that's not really a thing you know, if it is for some people, then good for you. But it's not really like a, a classic stereotype. So for her to be able to razz her into that, it shows a lot about all the characters. And I know about it. And it felt that very funny. And she's very commanding in that scene in which you have bloody <laughs> Rosie Dawson and Mary Elizabeth Winston, who is now my favorite actress, like in all of Hollywood at the moment, like, and has been for years and to be in almost a bit role compared to what you're saying is a stunt actor uh, is kind of amazing because she leads the second act. And I think in this rewatch, watching her razz up her friend and then get onto the fucking boot of that car and even just little tiny bits where she's like, oh, if I start on the bonnet. Is it that doesn't even count. Is, yeah, it yeah. doesn't fucking count. I'm just like, because yeah. I know what's coming. I'm like... She's a psycho. She's crazy. She's crazy. And Rosie Dawson has no idea what's coming. And she's like, oh, I'll fucking deal with it. I'm just like losing my mind being like, this is crazy. She's crazy, man. I'm freaking out. And to actually see it all play out is really, it is a great final set piece. It really, really is. It's spectacular. Um, it's so it's really cool, well yeah. done. It's just, the, you know, if anyone's ever going to do a car chase, you gotta, you gotta watch this movie, and you gotta see how it's done because it's, it's absolutely magnificent. Even when they pull out onto the road and they're weaving in and out of traffic, and it just the traffic, and, yeah, yeah. Just the geography of the car chase, like you always know where the cars are in relation to one another. You always know what's going on. It, it, it's only elusive when it's meant to be. Someone disappears out of frame, and it reappears. There's a magnificent shot of Kurt Russell when he thinks he's gotten away from them. That's my favorite bit, yeah. And we see the car just in the background, that white car come down as the hill reconnects and then slams in. Yeah. The end that... moment too, that just, du -du -du -du, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's fun. It's what cinema should be. I think it, 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 it's doing everything I want and it is, fundamentally about something it's 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 a a director who maybe feels like and he revisits some of these themes and extrapolates so much more on them and so much more expertly in once upon a time in hollywood yeah, but it yeah, is yeah. about a guy who feels like he's on his way out um yeah. it's just ironic that uh, you know he is maybe the one of the filmmakers left who's you know going to he, he's the only one who can really bring cinema in, in its purest form, which is like, I don't know what, I, what I'm going to get. 
I don't know what I'm going to get when I walk into a Tarantino film. And I always think I know what I want. Like I thought I knew what I wanted uh, once upon a time in Hollywood to be. And, and I was very like tilted when I walked out of the cinema because he didn't give me what I wanted. <laughs> but now I can look back and be like, no, nah, I'm an idiot. I don't know what I want. I need someone yeah. like him to give me what he knows because he knows so much more than me. <laughs> he's, he's an expert. He's an expert remixer of the finest parts of cinema and the worst parts of cinema. And he understands what works and what doesn't and how to weave it all together and to use the conventions of cinema in a way that delivers something that is unexpected but resonates. And he's done that time and time and time again. And revisiting Jackie Brown again, I look, I'll, I'll say Death Proof and Jackie Brown teeter below the, the bottom spot of his filmography. But I still rate them higher than most movies. I still think oh, yeah, they're sure. in the top 20% of movies I've ever seen. It's just that Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs, Kill Bill, Inglorious Bastards, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, even Hateful Eight when I revisited it, I got a lot more from. Hateful Eight might actually be my least favorite, I think. Can, can, can I just, just, just interject? Was Django Unchained left out of there intentionally or did you just forget it in that list? <laughs> oh, I don't want to hear the answer. Don't respond. I did, you son I did, of a bitch. I did. I forgot it, but I meant to oh, say okay, it. Right. I oh, love, okay. No, I, I was just going to say. No, I think I, that's my favorite of his by far. Not by far, but I just... Holy fuck, I love that movie so much. <laughs> it does... See, that's a movie that may actually... Like I thought was meandering the first time I saw it. I thought it's a movie with a fourth act. Who needs a fourth act? Dude, it's got the biggest fourth act of all time, but it's my favorite fourth act of any movie. But if you don't have that fourth act, then he never gets to... It's not a movie. ...become Django. Yeah, it's like... Not, yeah, it's not... It, it needs that fourth act, and the only... Because he's still, he's still chained. Is... He's still chained in the third act. He's yeah. still chained to it's... Christoph Waltz. He's still chained to the ideas he has. It's not until he comes back and he takes on his actual villain, who is Samuel L. Jackson, who yeah. is the archetypal anti Django. Anti... Yes, yeah. that's exactly it. Dude, and the first time I... you see it, you might not get it. Yeah, like the... I didn't get it. I, Did I you thought... know what? Yeah. Also, uh, no, no, sorry, th sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but I was just saying, you know what the biggest issue with that is? Is that it's just so long that when you get to that last minute, like, the only reason I hated it for the first time was I was like, I need to piss! It's been <laughs> two hours and 50 minutes! I've had a fucking liter and a half of Coca-Cola! I've eaten fucking two kilos of popcorn! I just had to piss, and I remember watching that movie, and I had to piss, and I just went, just end, just end. So themes, character, this... Nothing matters when you just, you're not just like, oh, I need to piss shit is a bit more, like it's 10% more tense. Yeah. It's like, I, like, you know, if I need to piss that badly, I would have smashed the camera and the lighting down in my room and I would have hung up the phone and I would have just taken a piss. Yeah. No, we would have just paused the podcast and I'm taking a piss. But you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's just that long a movie. It's almost three hours. And I think that I've watched it at home multiple times, but I don't think I've ever sat down and watched it. I mean, who, oh, fuck it. I don't know. But, you know, you can just pause and quickly go and have a snack, have a burrito, have have whatever you want. I'm, I'm just thinking, uh, you know, of any food. But, like, you know, you can just do whatever you want he and come used, back to the movie. He could have so used an intermission, vibe. I think. Uh, you know, like, yeah, it would have really felt uh, like... Hateful like Eight right. had an intermission. Did exactly. you see that in the cinema? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I quite enjoyed that. I remember I saw that. I actually... Fuck, I saw that. And Tarantino and... Samuel Jackson were there in Australia, in Melbourne. Can you believe it? Mm. The birthday present, which was so weird. Samuel Jackson's bald head was so smooth. I was like, the man looks 30. That's all I took away from it. And That's you, all I took away from seeing Tarantino live is Samuel Jackson looks 30. He's so smooth and bald. And you had an experience in that moment that you've told me about in the past where, where, where Tarantino came out and he said something that rubbed you the wrong way. And I just wanted to, I wanted to like, address that too because it what happened was he what, you tell the story because you you were there <laughs> tarantino came out after the movie and he ran down the staircase i was second seat from the side where he ran down so one person was between me and tarantino and he ran down and he's like oh fucking everybody you love my movie you love the hateful eight blah, 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 tarantino. Blah, 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 blah. what was your favorite bit your favorite bit was the bit where his head exploded and we all went yeah! 
and with this crowd screamed, and he's like, yeah, I'm Tarantino, look at my disgusting face, blah, and, <laughs> and I just remember, you wrong. I was like, fuck you, Tarantino, the best part of the film was the one shot from the start, where you came out of this tiny little thing, and then you went into this gorgeous wide shot of like 14,000 kilometers of snow, how do you even get the fucking diameters of the fr- I, there's just so much that made me angry about that, I'm like, you are not a 15 year old child making films like that, that's me! That is me making a film being like, what's your favorite bit? The time I exploded ahead? I just, oh, I was, I don't know. I was just like, he doesn't know what is good about his films. And maybe that's why this film isn't his best film. He's and you're right what's good. and you're wrong. Uh, and you're right. I'm, I'm probably more wrong than I'm right. You're right for because sure. he's making movies for both groups of people. And he's often said in regards to his filmography that there are two sets of films in his movies. So the characters in the movie are aware of movies themselves. Yeah. And then there are movie movies that are the, the characters in like Pulp Fiction and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Jackie Brown, they all talk about movies in those movies. And it's almost like another level deep. And it's, it's, it's hard to find the line. So like Kill Bill, Death Proof, uh, are, are examples of movies that are in the movies that he's making. Yeah. So, like, the characters in Pulp Fiction conceivably could have gone and seen Kill Bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a, it's a movie that exists on another level where all the characters in it are aware of the movies. But no one in Kill Bill is aware of the movies because they're just so steeped in the movie. I think Django is one where I don't know what part of the line it is. It could be either. I actually probably think it's a movie movie because it just feels more like a Kill Bill than it does like a Once Upon a Time or a Pulp Fiction. For sure. Um, but, but the fact that he's making movies and, and that he has these layers to it, it's an expression of the fact that he's trying to make movies for multiple sets of people at once. And when he walked into that crowded theatre, if he came in and he said, who loved that long, continuous shot at the opening of the film where I slowly panned back and revealed the carriage coming through the snow? It took me 47 takes and three horses died in the snow because it was so cold. You yeah, would have yeah. been the only one to stand up and cheer. Yeah, if he yeah exactly. <laughs> but the rest of the people in the cinema would have been like, what the fuck are you talking about? I liked and it when that guy's head exploded when he got shot in the face. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I think that's why... He's going he's, to the crowd, for sure. For that's sure. why he's he's been so successful because he can play to both sides of the crowd at once <laughs> and, and that he can blow a guy's head up but he also gives you the 15 minutes of tension that lead up to that head explosion that make the head explosion make... worth it exactly, and he knows yeah. that he's done that work to get there which is why yeah. I think he earned the right to come in and act like an idiot in that moment even though it rubbed you the wrong way and I, you know if I were in that position it might have rubbed me the wrong way too especially after the first time I saw The Hateful Eight because I was like, oh, this isn't, this it just isn't felt his like best. It, was the, it was just felt like the film that was finally like, okay, so everyone sits in a room, they talk, and then they all die. Yeah. That's your shtick. You have a shtick. It felt like when I watched Guy Ritchie's like seventh film, where I'm like, so everyone's just Johnny, Johnny Seven Fingers, and he's got seven fingers, and he's a, everyone's a gangster. You know what I mean? Like, and you can, you can distill all great filmmakers into a thing oh everyone every every christopher nolan film has you, you know it's like you can distill everything negatively after someone's made so many films and there's some kind of connective tissue between all of them yes and, and if that yeah. rubs you the wrong way on the first viewing in a cinema and i saw tarantino alive and i was just overwhelmed with like excitement and joy and then he said that i just went i don't think he gets it i don't yeah. think he gets why this film worked and then I think he, I think I'm seeing why it didn't work for me fully. But you know what? That film is great. I, I and, have, I and, do like it. So and I, you can, you can weigh that up as well. Cause if you really want to, you can go and do what I've been doing the last few weeks and you can dive deep and you can listen to Tarantino talk for hours and hours and hours and all these podcasts. And then you really, really get a sense that he's not that guy that you saw in the cinema that night, that he is 
an expert at the top of his craft and that he is incredibly self-aware, that he knows that he only has so much in him, that he's aware of his weak points and what movies are his strongest and his weakest. He's, he's self-critical in a way that I don't see other directors be self-critical. Like, you'll never see Christopher Nolan come out and be like, Insomnia is my worst film, you know? He just won't ever say it, even though it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. <laughs> um, but look, I think I've covered kind of everything I wanted to hear. The, you know, I just wanted to be... I wanted this to be a, a defense of Death Proof, of, of, of a film that, that might be a director's worst but it still has so much to offer. It still is so magnificent in so many ways. And I think fundamentally misunderstood now, now that you know, a lot of movies over time enter the public consciousness in a very positive way and, and, and movies kind of drift into people's minds and they half forget about them, but they linger there and we all collectively remember them a certain way. And sometimes it's true and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's a Forrest Gump where everyone has incredibly fond memories of just a dumpster fire of a movie that, that, that I just do not find redeeming in any way. Yet the Hot public- take! <laughs> we'll have to do that movie because I agree. Piece of shit yeah, film. But, but, but you know what I mean? You know how that film has shifted into the... Oh yeah, masterpiece the, territory. Of course. of course. But it's not. Yeah. It's not no, 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 piece of shit movie with fine actor and by fine I mean... Super overrated. But then, just by nature of Death Proof being part of a catalogue of one of the most influential filmmakers of the modern era, of of the true postmodern filmmaker, that that you know that it is now deemed a bad film. It has sixty percent on Rotten Tomatoes. People shit on it all the time. It's just yeah, exactly. It's just it's just not right. It's just so far above and beyond what I think the legacy is that it has and I hope that that starts to shift and that's where I'll leave it. Spoiler Talk is produced by KCBN Studios and Space Kraken Media.